Eric is a fellow at the Norwegian liberal think tank uh, Civita. He's the host of Civita's weekly podcast, Liberal Half Hour. He has a BA in Comparative Politics and MA in History from the University of Bergen. Then give it up for Eric, please. Thank you. Thank you so much. This is on. You can hear me? Yes. Ec excellent. Thank you for the opportunity to chair this discussion on racism, identity, politics, and free expression. Obviously, these are big questions worthy of a lecture or ten, but when we only have a little over one hour, so I will do my best to cover the issues as thoroughly and interesting as possible. Well, we have a lot to cover and limited time, so I'll just uh, pass the floor to you, Gitta. Uh, please, let's get started. Uh, it's good to be back. It's very good to be back with all of you celebrating dissent. Um, I've been in India since the pandemic uh, for four years, so uh, I've lived in uh, the heart of a different kind of extremism, but which also affects both Muslims and ex-Muslims. And um, uh, it is good to be back in this room celebrating, but in a time of extreme danger. I mean, this panel is about racism and identity politics, but we have not only the politics of the communities that we've come from, particularly if you're living in a Western country as a minority, but the politics of the, the really what's become in many countries the dominant politics of the far right. And I don't think that we can forget that as an extreme danger to both Muslims and ex-Muslims, because one, the two are not always identifiable separately, and two, even though some far-right movements seek to embrace uh, specific Muslims with specific criticisms of Islam, they don't embrace the conditions, that, you know, they don't embrace any help for the conditions that force them to flee their countries to, to you know, to many of you have gone into exile. You're here, you're able to be here because many of you are exiled from your countries of birth. And many of you, uh, and, and in, in Ina's case, it's not as an ex-Muslim, but as a campaigner against religion of all kinds. And many of you live in extreme danger where you are. So the need for a solidarity movement that stands against um, uh, both racism and religious fundamentalism and religious oppression and can manage the thought on those things all at the same time, I think, is extremely important. Uh, and very intense. Uh, in, in India, for instance, uh, the government in power is a far-right uh, government, and the, which has a massive troll army, like uh, the Russians have a massive troll army and so on, and often they join ex-Muslim uh, handles, they support them, they, they, they cheer them on, uh, and of course that's encouraging from people who, as you've described, daily face hate and threats and violence, both online and offline. But I really want you all to know that the government is very comfortable with authoritarian regimes. It's, in, it's comfortable with the government of Iran, it's comfortable with all the Gulf monarchies, with Saudi Arabia, uh, with, with, uh, it's comfortable with other, Turkey, with other authoritarians, you know, so being, um, against Islam does not make them against Islamic regimes. And I, uh, you know, I'd just like us to bear those things in mind when we're, we're sort of discussing the other issues of identity politics that will come up. I think we'd, I'd like us to talk uh, uh, and to think about in the future what we do about the issues of refugee in a time of increased hostility to migration and in general, and to refugees specifically, and each country wanting to close its borders and tighten its rules, um, and you know how we as a movement can stand up against this and argue for the diversity within our communities as well as diversity within the general uh, states and uh, countries anywhere in the world. I mean, this this issue applies to. Uh, India, Bangladesh, and so on, as much as it applies uh, in the West. 
And finally, um, I know we have a very short time, so I'm, uh, I'm going to try and find a poem and read it. And it's, a, it's in a way a present from uh, the, my family. I mean, it's not written by my family, but it's a poem that I heard in my family. But my grandmother was a freedom fighter uh, for Indian independence in the 1920s, 30s, 40s. Uh, and later, and fought for universal human rights, fought for the UN Charter to be a, a charter that not only spoke to the interests of the Western powers, but also to the interests of the colonized people and against colonialism. Uh, and Indian feminists had a role in making the Universal Declaration of Human Rights a more feminist declaration that got, talked about all human beings are equal in dignity and rights. Um, and so she used to recite this poem when she, she my, my grandfather died of his imprisonments and uh, she was imprisoned many times and my mother recites it now, who stands for secularism and liberty in modern India with many of our friends in prison. And this, the poem goes like this, mourn not the dead, and it's, it's written by a man called R Ralph Chaplin. Mourn not the dead that in the cool earth lie, dust unto dust, the scarm sweet earth that mothers all who die, as all men must. Mourn not your captured comrades who must dwell. Too strong to strive, each in his steel-bound coffin of a cell, buried alive. But neither, but rather mourn the apathetic throng, the cowed and the meek who see the world's great anguish and its wrong and dare not speak. Uh, I see uh, you need to also share the microphones, but, but, but since you come from a various background, I would like to, just to all of you just to give two or three minutes to introduce your situation in light of this theme. And, and uh, we can, uh, we can uh, move on to, to Rahila Gupta, if you just two or three minutes, uh, uh, yeah, give a brief presentation of your situation and how you view this uh, theme in, this, uh, in light of the question. Okay, um, before I actually talk about my own context, um, in terms of the themes of this panel, and in particularly in terms of identity politics, I just wanted to comment on some of the things that were being said in terms of what Yasmin said in response to what Ina said about the failure of Western feminism. And I don't want to give white Western feminism, I don't want to let them off the hook, but all I wanted to say about that was it's a classic example of how identity politics operates in the West in order to shut down a debate based on political values. So for example, I remember when I was speaking at a conference in London to an all white, practically all white uh, audience and I was criticizing the hijab because I said that it was a regressive choice and it had you know, regressive meanings for feminism. Uh, a white woman came up to me at the end of it and she said, I'm so glad you said that because I wouldn't dare say that. And this is what identity politics has done to us because it's told us that only if you have you come from that community, are you allowed to speak? And even when you come from that community, as ex-Muslims are found to their uh, you know, uh, disadvantage, that you can't even talk about it, then you would be probably considered to be a self-hating Muslim. Um, and I think that this is a really big problem in terms of um, how we are constrained from coming together in terms of solidarity politics. And it's the perfect, expression, I think, of neoliberalism, because neoliberalism tends towards individualization, atomization against collective solidarities. So just having said that, I think that in relation to my own context in London, I've been involved for 35 years now with an organization called Southall Black Sisters. 
And the word black is what I want to particularly talk about in relation to the title and uh, this issue of how you can choose an identity, how I chose an identity when I came to Britain, which I saw as expansive and one that made political alliances with groups with racialized minorities who lived in Britain. And I think that um, we it's been very contested. It was contested before, and it continues to be uh, heavily contested, and even more so today. And for us uh, at South Old Black Sisters, it was a secular space to which we could escape. It freed us from our religious and caste identities. And that was really important for us, because the movement has been so just to give you a little bit of history on uh, political blackness, because it's a very British debate. You know, even Americans don't understand it. And I mention Americans simply because a lot of the debates in Britain seem to refer back to America, particularly around race. But for 45 seconds, and then we have to move on. OK, well, I, I can't talk about political blackness without giving a little bit of the history. And it, it emerged from anti-colonial struggles in the 40s and 50s in Britain, when all the, uh, the anti-colonial struggles were headquartered in Britain, and they realized that they needed a united front against their colonial masters. So that's what we grew out of, this sense of solidarity. and. Um, it was a uniting element, which is the really important thing, which since then we have moved into identifying uh, as nationalities. So, you know, first it was Asian, African, Caribbean, then it was Indian, Bangladeshi, Pakistani, and then down to Hindu, Muslim, etc. And this is why I think it's such a dangerous uh, um, direction that we are moving in, in terms of identity politics. Okay, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Siavash, uh, did I get that pronouncing correctly? Excellent. Uh, two, three minutes uh, about your context and your background. Uh, okay, I'm from Iran, but at the moment I live in Athens, in Greece, as a political refugee. Um, uh, in Iran, I was working on, of course, uh, children's rights, and this was very prominent for us to talk about how the education system should be, how the system is dealing with children, uh, what uh, this uh, re religion education f by force in the schools. So, of course, it's a very complicated uh, topic to, to speak about it in Iran, and we were always under uh, attack. And in just two, three years, our organization was uh, completely destroyed. But uh, at the moment, my focus in Athens is uh, about racism. And uh, as far as I'm also involved with asylum uh, situation there in Greece, in the islands and in the camps, that uh, it's a very brutal situation, actually. And I have to mention this, that how European Union generally is using this situation in Greece with the poor management, with the all these uh, failed policies to just keeping this pushback against the refugees and the borders, and it's very brutal. Always we are seeing deaths and so many uh, issues. But I want to also, um, uh, starting from this point, that Greece itself has, has been mentioned also about this type of countries that also they're dealing with fundamentalism from a different way. It's not just these countries in East with Islamic states. We have also this type of countries like Greece that, okay, is a secular, but religion plays very important role in this country. It's a very conservative society. And at the same time, you have to deal with Orientalism and upside down Orientalism, in my view. And I think uh, as far as we're dealing with this type of racism, that's why we have to also understand that why we have right wings, that they are brutally uh, keeping these pushbacks and uh, forcing people back and uh, co talking like uh, calling them like, okay, we don't want this Muslim, we don't want this culture. And from the other side, we have this left wing that is just saying everything is fine, it's cool, it's their own decision, it's their own culture. And they don't give a space to talk about what is the actual problems and what is the actual reason that people are moving. So 30 seconds. We have always these issues that we cannot talk about the original problems 
that we actually have to escape from it, which we will continue to talk about it. Yeah, sure. We also have a microphone over there, so you can, if, if that's on, you can use it. And uh, uh, Suhail, uh, your context, two, three minutes. So um, I come from Canada. I was, I was raised there. Um, I serve as um, president of the ex-Muslims of Toronto. And uh, in, in the Canadian context, at least on this subject, I don't think it's as colorful as some of the um, activities in Europe and the controversies in Europe. Uh, that being said, I think in the Canadian context, we had migration at a more gradual pace many decades ago. And I think, this is from my own perspective, what that created was a little bit more of an integrated foundation for future waves of immigration. And so relative to some of the um, influx and, and sort of ghettoized communities we see in Europe, we didn't really have that um, to the degree in, in Canada. So things are a little bit more moderate that way. Um, that being said, many of, or I'd say the majority of people that we have who come into our community are still closeted from their families. Um, it's only people who have been part of our support communities for many, many years or are now in their 30s and beyond that have slowly been able to come out uh, to their families. So there is a good positive trend there. Um, but politically, um, I don't think it's, uh, well, it's not as talked about, but there is a, a strong sense of uh, not really challenging Islam. It's it's part of the multicultural mosaic. That's kind of the Canadian way. So we haven't really had those controversies, although there was a motion back in, I think it was 2016, an Islamophobia bill. And it was rightly criticized as singling out Islam as if there should, should be special protection there. Um, luckily, it doesn't have any legal teeth, but that is the backdrop as... Um, there's a greater and greater Muslim population in Canada uh, that's rising. Um, and I think in the next generation, we'll really see how that shakes out. Do most of the next generation moderate, leave the faith, or does fundamentalism take hold? Uh, I think that's an open question for the future. Mm. I'll leave the rest for questions. Thank you. Taha, two, three minutes, your background, your context. Right. Uh, so uh, thank you for having me here. Um, uh, I'm just going to open up with uh, with uh, in a, a thing that happened last weekend. I was at a conference uh, in France. I, I, I am a political refugee living in France uh, since the last six years. I'm a journalist in exile and I speak a lot about freedom of expression. Um, uh, and I was invited to speak at, a, at an event where we were talking about how there is freedom of expression declining around the world. Uh, and um, I, 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 you know, we talked about Pakistan, where I'm from. We talked about India, about how freedom of expression is going down, and then, you know, uh, globally how it's it's degrading. And then uh, when it, it was my turn to talk about it, I was like, okay, you know, we've talked about everywhere, but we haven't talked about France. Uh, and um, I, I, I brought up the idea of how, you know, in France there is, uh, you know, the uh, because of national security law. Uh, there are there have been uh, you know journalists who have been questioned for leaking information because there was France is selling weapons to Saudi Arabia or Yem uh, which are being used in Yemen or France is selling weapons to Egypt which are which are not which it's you know it's uh, uh, violating certain laws etc and then I said how uh, the media uh, ownership is being concentrated amongst the very few rich in France which is also threatening the freedom of expression. Uh, and I went on and gave some other examples about how freedom of expression and freedom of press is threatened uh, in France. Uh, once the, the session ended, uh, uh, the first question that came was from a, a, a lady who was present in the audience. And she said uh, that, uh, uh, you know, uh, I mean, she was in, we were talking in French, but uh, something on the along the lines of uh, how dare you uh, criticize uh, France, the country that has given you refuge. Uh, how dare you, uh, you know, say all of these things? And I am really offended that you're here, you know, in your, our safety, and now you're criticizing France. Uh, 
Uh, and and uh, to that, I just wanted to respond that you know, freedom of expression is something that is not, not something that is taken for granted. That is, it, it's a constant battle. It's a constant fight. And we need to continue fighting it, not just in our own countries, but in the West also in very different ways, as, as has been mentioned. Uh, and, and this idea that freedom of expression could, could be a Western idea or could be this, you know, uh, uh, American or uh, English or French idea. No, it is not. These are universal ideas. Secularism is a universal idea. And all my life, living in Pakistan, I fought for these, while without perhaps labeling them as freedom of expression or as secularism. Um, and uh, Coming to the other part of this idea of identity, um, you know, ever since I've gone into exile, uh, identity has become a big question for me as to who am I, 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 you know, because I was born in Pakistan, so am I continue to be Pakistani, though I live in France, I have a child growing up in France, so is he fr French, is he Pakistani, and because of all of that, uh, identity has become a, a sort of a, a thing that I do not agree with, this, this whole idea of identity, because just because I was born somewhere doesn't mean that I will have to live with that identity for all my life. I, I can choose to have whatever identity I have. And, um, you know, uh, I, I'll give you two examples of it, which, which happened... Th 30 uh, seconds. Yes, uh, I'll try to finish in 20 seconds, or I'll come back to it yeah. later. But, um, you know, um, uh, recently my child, uh, who's 11 years old, uh, when he was around 7, 8, he was in school, uh, in a French public school, and he was, uh, this was Ramadan time in, in France. Uh, so... Uh, he uh, was asked by one of his classmates with obviously Muslim background as to why he's not, uh, you know, starting his fast or going to go come and do fast. So my son came up to us, uh, the parents, and said that, why are we not fasting? And I was like, uh, you know, we don't practice Islam. And, and, and then he was like, yeah, but we're from Pakistan. And my friend said, from Pakistan, people fast, so you have to fast, and if you don't fast, you will go to hell, and etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. You know how, uh, and so I had to explain him all of that. So this was something that 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 like you know also when we're in the West and we're 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 still again boxed into our own sort of like you know country identities, even if you want to let go of them. And the second example, very quickly, is, is something that um, so I, I wrote a, a comic book, a graphic novel, which is called The Dissident Club, which is named after a bar that I run in Paris. Uh, and uh, I have I have the book here. I, I wanted to show you, but maybe I'll show you later. Uh, <coughs> so there's a drawing of Allah in uh, on page uh, 20 or the 21st of uh, which I was done by my cartoonist uh, because I had a dream when I was young because my parents used to talk about the Judgment Day all the time. So I had a dream about the Judgment Day, and and the the, the scene is recreated in the book uh, showing Allah. And I went to a, f a French school to talk about this book. And one student, after my session, got up and said, uh, Sir, you have this drawing of Allah, and this is not good, and this is not uh, allowed. And so I had to explain him that this is a dream, and this is something that really happened. And then after that, the, the French white teacher came up to me and said that we're very glad that there was someone from a Muslim background, uh, someone from uh, you know a brown face, someone who has this kind of context explaining to someone uh, that you know this this is allowed and this can be allowed. And so I was so th so these are the struggles that I face with uh, identity politics, with racism, migration, and freedom of expression that I wanted to just add as an open opening statement. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Uh, long 20 seconds, but very interesting. And, and uh, it was great to have, uh, have, have you all explain a bit of about your background and uh, your, your context. And, and if I try to, to connect it to more universal discussion, and I think some of you have mentioned it, um, uh, uh, the question of racism. Uh, and I was wondering, I, I want to hear from, from all of you in the panel, in the public discourse here, um, you have, you have. It seems to me, at least, the, the fear of being labeled a racist, or is it actually a problem with racism in the West? And, and, and how, how does this affect the, the public discourse? Uh, we can start with you, you Gita. Um, uh, if I were to to, uh, to ask the question like this, what is the biggest uh, uh, difficulty there? Racism, or that people are afraid of being labeled as racist? I think it's both, as I tried to indicate in um, my remarks. 
that it, it there is the fear, as, as we've heard the examples from the panel, and also therefore people like us who do speak out, other people say, oh, thank God, you, thank God, yes, <laughs> that you said that, <laughs> because, you know, we can't say it. So that's the fear, um, and, and the labeling is there, because um, there, there's a very organized lobbies and, and in academia, in political movements and so on, that will attack people, they will attack ex-Muslims for being Islamophobes and so on. So there is that fear. But let's not forget there's racism. I, I, I also wanted to acknowledge, and when we're talking about racism, that this Norway is the country that faced one of the worst far-right racist attacks ever to take place in the world. Andre Breivik killed dozens of people, children, young people, who were having a summer holiday and, and in a camp, you know, uh, the, the expression of a free multicultural society. That's what he was attacking. A lot of people said he was attacking Muslims, but actually he chose not to attack a mosque, but to attack a multiracial, multi-religious group of social Democrats, I understand, right. you know. So uh, uh, the, the best of the spirit of Norway in, 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 many, in many ways. So that is happening in our midst as well, and it's threatened all the time. Um, it, it's been happening in Britain. There were massive. Um, uh, there, there was a mobilization of the far right, which led to a counter mobilization by anti racists which many of us would join because even though we disagree with them on other issues, some of the left, we do stand for the protection of asylum seekers, for migrants, and so on. So I think it's both. Yeah. Uh, we can move on to Taha. Give your your uh, your uh, your views here, and uh, then we take also the rest of the panel, please. Uh, you know, I, I just wanted to add this, and this is something that I've, I've said before also, uh, is, uh, you know, uh, the term Islamophobia, which you were mentioning about how sometimes ex-Muslims, and I've been accused of it as an ex-Muslim uh, of Islamophobia by people back in Pakistan or on, on social media, etc. Um, I, I think, uh, you know, we uh, uh, should, uh, ex-Muslims at least should uh, start to own the word Islamophobia, uh, because we are victims of Islam, you know, and we have, this. so, so it's, it's just like the same with the LGBTQ community, where the the queer word was was used to be as an insult before before it was appropriated and, and taken back by the LGBT community and and said that no, we will use this in a positive influence. And I think uh, you know uh, the idea of uh, of labeling Islamophobia a shut debate. Uh, I think we should re respond that with this idea that uh, no. All our lives, we've lived in a country, especially in, you know, coming from Pakistan, where we were victims of Islamism, where we were we were uh, you know uh, threatened because of that. And so today, yes, we are Islamophobic because of that particular background. So that context really matters. Mm. So, Hail, you mentioned that uh, in in Canada, we will see uh, going forward how this discussion will will move on. Uh, what's your advice, and, or how 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 would you like to see uh, these topics discussed, like without when people are feared of being labeled racist, and and when you have racism, how how, how do you balance these things? Yeah, so I I sense a, a more of a fear of self censorship out there in Canada and people being afraid of being labeled a racist. Luckily, there's still an environment of conversation where people push back and try to explain no, um, we're criticizing ideas, we're not racists, and I think you know in the central theme of this panel of talking about identity politics and uh, you know how that relates to universalism, I think the most important thing for us to do is always push for universal ideals, point that as our North Star, and that identity politics has a place only in terms of remediation to bring uh, us back to universalism where we've fallen short. Um, and we protect ourselves from overshooting and creating other problems, which I think creates a, a legitimate uh, risk of racism as a backlash. Mm. Um, so I think we have to resist the urge of self-censorship self -censorship, um, and speak our truth, uh, speak um, about our ideas and not cower so that we can maintain in the uh, discourse the ability to, to criticize 
ideas which we currently still have in Canada. Mm. And uh, Rahila and then Siavash, uh, like to hear your, yeah, let's have another go and see if it works this time. Please. Um, yeah, so I think first of all, it's when you talk about public discourse, what do you mean by public discourse? Is this a public conversation? Do we have a public discourse when we talk about social media? And on social media, it's a no holds barred conversation. There is extreme racism, sexism, misogyny, homophobia. If And there's a huge degree of contradiction as well in this whole question, because if you take public discourse to mean uh, what goes on between government and politicians and so on. There's a huge amount of sensitivity in the UK about you know, uh, racism and uh, any racial slurs. So uh, an Asian woman, uh, Labour MP Rupa Huck, uh, said of a black Tory who was speaking on the radio that he sounds, he does not sound like he is black. That was considered to be racist. She was suspended. She was actually making a reference to his private school upper class background. She was not actually, she was talking about the fact that most black people are too poor to be able to go to private school. She was suspended. At the same time, both the Labour Party and the Tory Party have been talking, well, Labour Party less so about the boat people, but they're still actually very, very dangerously on the same ground as the Tories about the boat people who are coming here. And we've seen what that kind of narrative has led to. The, the the race riots that we are talking about in the UK recently, there's, there are direct links between that and, and that sort of narrative. Now, is that seen to be racist? No, that seemed to be a legitimate definition of self, of British um, you know, self-interest and, and, and so on, national interest, should I put it. And uh, so, yes, yeah, so I think that's basically my problem with um, how there's a kind of contradiction in this whole discussion and no acknowledgement of the real racism of immigration rules and laws and the fact that those uh, people who were out on the street, they, had, they made no distinction between asylum seekers and the rest of us. We all felt threatened by it. We could have been there for 40 years or, or five years or been born there and the word Packy, go home, was you know painted on all the uh, the walls of the asylum. They 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 weren't making a distinction. So it's th it's a very dangerous narrative that we are facing from mainstream politicians as well. Siavash. Well, I would like to talk about my own experience because I'm a refugee. I mean, when I it's recently also. So when I went to Greece, the first thing that is just smashing my face was that, oh, you are Islamophobe. <laughs> like, look at me where I came from. <laughs> what is this question? Because we dare to challenge them. Like you are dealing with a group of people that they want to fight racism, but eventually they have a package ready. They install it on you. They're just like, this is your culture. This is the concept. This is what you are. You cannot be something else. It's like, you know, in the previous conversations was also women when speak, it's something different. So you de obey what has been for centuries described as a society and eventually you are talking against this. So now I'm a refugee from another country. I came here. I, I am not allowed to speak. Why did I run? Why I moved here? Because they don't want to disturb what... I call it fantasies that they created and they're calling it against racism. Because they're like, okay, let's imagine, I'm under this asylum system. I have to defend myself to get this asylum. I have to prove what was my issues. So one of my issues was in 2012 when the Naked uh, Calendar published it, we put it on the wall. We become naked, a group of the friends, uh, women, men. We took the photos, we share it, we publish it. So I show it this. In Iran, when I was in Iran, <laughs> and I showed this to the activists in Greece, and I said this is to the fe to feminists, and so this is what we done in Iran in 2012, and I had to prove myself to this type of people, like I was proving myself in the asylum system. That's why we're fighting this. What is the issue? And this is uh, I want to also refer to this. This is the one problem because this feminism that we were talking about that, that have been mentioned that failed us. Because it's not criticizing church. 
in this type of countries, is doesn't allow itself to criticize it, to attack it. Greece is a country we have a highest range of uh, femicide, rape, and all of these issues, and uh, they don't dare to talk about it, to challenge it. But it's us, it's easy for us to just say this is your package, this is what you are. So don't disturb these uh, conversations here. There, there are a lot of interesting things uh, being said, and we're, we're moving uh, towards the end. So I want to open up for questions also from the audience. But uh, while uh, I have noticed you, sir, sitting in the in the in the in the middle, uh, but I want to have uh, 90 seconds from each of the panel and ask this question: Given that there is uh, some tension between universalism and identity politics, is identity politics always wrong? Are there things, places, contexts where we need more identity politics? We can start with you, Gita. <laughs> it's, no, it's not always wrong. The ex-Muslim movement is an identity movement in a way. It's an identity movement based on leaving Islam, but also, I hope, building a shed of, set of shared values. Sometimes the only common value gluing the ex-Muslim movement together is the leaving of Islam, and there's a wide range of other politics as well. But I think if we're talking about universalism, universalism is not white, and it's not a blank slate. People come to universalism with the culture that they inherited, with the systems that they inherited, and they add to that understanding. So there's a common understanding, as you said, uh, Suhail, a North Star, but it, it comes in different forms, and I think that's what we have to understand. Uh, Rahila? Yeah, just share the mic mics. I, yeah, I don't see that there is a particular contradiction between ID, identity politics and uh, universalism. I think it has been used by, say, for example, religious and community leaders to say that um, we are, you know, universal values are co contradict our culture. They so what is their culture? Their culture, you know, might be that women should dress and walk and sit and talk in a particular kind of way, or that you know, there's there are honor crimes or there's FGM. So it's a question of using, uh, attacking universalism uh, by saying, well, this does not speak to our culture. So f from that kind of ID politics, we certainly have to rescue the notion of universalism. But there is a way in which there is a positive use of identity politics, which is women, say, from our communities can actually say, we believe that it's a universal value, a right of a woman to live free from violence, and on those grounds of universalism, we challenge you. So it provides us with a, an armory of uh, arguments against the most reactionary um, cho um, trends in our community. Um, well, you know, I think the question is, uh, if, uh, because we're talking, we're in West, we're talking here, the question for me is, if here in West there is this will to share their privileges with others? Because it's, um, for me, it's not the question of right wing only. It's everybody. When you decided to share your privilege with me also, that you, word by word, we say word by word, we ask same thing, exactly. But eventually, we are different. We have a different values, and they don't want to share it. I have been questioned in many events. So Iranian woman wants a Western lifestyle. Or in Iran, when we're fighting against death penalty for children. It's so like, just imagine. I mean, like, imagine 70 years ago, maybe this was a case in Europe too. So what happened? So do you want that culture to come back? Or you want to defeat that and also support me, help me to achieve that. So this is a question for me, when they want to share their privilege. And I've actually acknowledge it and that they have this privilege and after they share it with others. So, I, so just building a little bit on what Rahila mentioned, um, I think we have to be on guard for identity politics that seeks to carve out special exceptions and undermine universalism. Uh, similar to the concept that uh, you know, tolerance of intolerance is not really tolerance. It, it will be hijacking our tolerance to undermine that value, similar to how in, in we can have free speech. 
except for calls to violence because that's intimidating um, and obviously hurts people. Um, so we have to be careful about some of these maxims becoming back doors for undermining those universal principles themselves. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> I, I think identity um, uh, is not, for me, at least a singular idea. I have multiple identities um, and um, yeah, multiple shared identities with different people. Um, uh, and I think, uh, you know, uh, going back to this, what I was saying earlier about uh, since I've gone into exile in France, uh, this question of identity has become a thing that uh, that 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 I view from two parts, which is one, what what is my own identity, but what about that identity card that I get? And you know, uh, the 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 laws in France are becoming stricter and stricter to get that identity card. Um, today, for example, I mean, recently they passed a law to so that you ha your language uh, test that you have to pass has to be a at a higher level. Uh, you you know you, you have to show more integration into the French society, etc., and to identify yourself as French. But uh, I mean. I uh, live in Paris, uh, I run a bar, I wrote a book uh, in French, I have my son going to a French school, I don't know how more French I can become. But despite that, the state of France uh, or every state around the world wants to control this idea of I giving you an identity card, giving you a passport. And for me, I think uh, on individual levels, we should just have many shared identities and we should, we should celebrate those identities. Uh, but the state should stop telling us what our identity is. I've noticed three people coming on the speaker's list. The first, the gentleman sitting there, and the two, three, okay, and four, five. Uh, let's see how many we can uh, many intervention we can take. The first one coming there. Thank you. Very interesting topic. Uh, I have a question, particularly for Siavesh or any of you who would like to answer it. I would be very pleased to listen to you guys talking about Orientalism. Uh, the thing is, like, uh, my question is, like, do you see any uh, relation between uh, secularism in the Middle East and the racism in the West? Like, if this um, ongoing um, revolution, women, life, freedom, or other sort of protest in the Middle East can turn the country or Middle Eastern countries into secularism, how it would solve the racism issue in the West? Do you see any relation between these two or not? Siavash, we want to start? Yeah. Uh, as I said, is this uh, when we talk about Orientalism, it's uh, these expectations uh, that uh, there is a package that it describes what is a Muslim society, what is an Islamic country. And the question is that women, life, freedom in Iran, it's, it's a movement that it wants, it's not just fighting for a secular system, it's uh, um, a renaissance, a cultural renaissance that is gone going there. So how far it's going to affect other countries in the Middle East is something else, which I see so many things in Egypt, I see so many things in Lebanon. Co can we compare them? I don't know. I don't have this type of information and knowledge to, to say how far they're so much connected to each other. But as far as is, this revolution is going on and it's breaking this uh, fake identity that is around of us, that who is, what is this Muslim society and who you are as a Siavesh or each, all, each one of us as a Muslim. I think the most point is that how we are going to break it. I don't know, I mean this racism that you are describing also is very, it's something that it's very different. How I deal with it in Greece is so much different than how I saw it in Spain actually or recently I saw it in Germany when I was when we were discussing it so I don't know how uh, I, I I don't know how it's gonna reflect on this point in West because uh, the, the, the point is different in, uh, in in West I think they are gonna surprise because when I describe like the recent res uh, the recent um, research in Iran by the state itself proved that 70 percent more of this society doesn't believe anymore religion and doesn't practice it it's something that everybody are like they're looking at me and it's not how such a thing is possible yeah. so 
Yeah, Rahila wanna weigh in and also talk. Okay, one minute each before we move on to Mariam and, and try to get as many inter interventions as possible. Please. Yeah, it's slightly tangentially. Tangentially, um, I was attending a conference of Saudi Arabian dissidents who were talking about the uh, investment of the U.S in not wanting democracy in Saudi Arabia and in any of those uh, Middle Eastern countries because of the way in which it would affect the Palestinian struggle for self-determination because all of those populations in all of those countries are for Palestinian self-determination and they're being suppressed by the rulers of uh, Saudi, for example. So there is also a vested uh, Western interest, you know, which is against democracy and against secularism for their bigger, wider geopolitical interests. So there's also that question. Taha, one minute. I, I just wanted to say that, you know, uh, I, I grew up in the Middle East myself in Saudi Arabia. Uh, and uh, I was, uh, as a Pakistani growing up in Saudi Arabia, there was a lot of discrimination against Pakistanis or South Asians, and there was a lot of r racism in that way. Uh, and and this is not just a Western idea that you know, you know, there's this racism against you know migrants, etc. It's a, it's a it's it happens in Pakistan, for example. Pakistanis, uh, I know many of them are like use uh, black slurs, uh, you know, to to insult you. Uh, so so this idea of racism is is sort of existing across the the the, the globe, and I. I think it's it, it comes from this idea that you know instead of celebrating differences and celebrating diversity, uh, we try to say that you know that you, because you're different and you're other, so you must be some there must, must be something wrong. And that that I've faced that in Pakistan, I faced that in Saudi Arabia, and you know in in Europe. So it's across across the uh, the, the globe. Yes, we have three women on the first row, all uh, assigned for interventions. Okay. Yes, please. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, you know, uh, I'm Nadia Alfani. I'm, I grew up in Tunisia. My father is Tunisian. My mother was French. And uh, I grew up in a communist family, you know. And I think my identity is coming from that because I never mentioned, you know, in my family uh, to, be, to believe in God or something. But I was in a society who most of the people believe, you know, in God. And also my cousin, you know, when I was uh, a child and I saying, uh, you know, I don't believe, they, they told me that you are going to hell. So I think the, the in France, we have the laïcité, you know. So that's, it's very important to mention that because, of course, it's not like in Greece when you speak about religion and you, you, you criticism your, your, your country. In France, it's not the same, you know, because we have laïcité. But, but now the far right in France use the laïcité to be racist against the Islam, you know, or against the Muslims, sorry, not Islam. And this is very different, you know. We have to make really a difference be, be, between the Muslims and be, between the religion, you know. We can, if we want to live in equal rights, we have to ask for this principle of laicity. Please don't say any more secular. It's not the same, you know, because it's a politic principle. And this is very important to ask for equality, because we saw it in Iran, you know, when the, the, the women and the people ask, they ask for a civil state, you know, and also in the revolution in Tunisia, when we start, we, ask, we were asking for a civil state, and this is laicity, civil state, so you can put the religion out from our decision of politics. And I just want to remember that that laicity is coming from the left. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, ex excellent. Uh, uh, we have a lot of intervention. I think we just take the interventions and we let the panel summarize at the end so we make sure that everybody can get, get the chance. Please, Mariam. Great, thank you. Well, I do want to say that I think identity politics is always negative, in my opinion. And I think because it is very often imposed from above and it is meant to divide. If you're in the group, you're superior. If you're outside of the group, you're uh, inferior. And I think when we look at the ex-Muslim movement, for, for example, for me, I think it's not an identity movement. It's a civil rights movement, just like the movement for the liberation of, 
uh, black people against apartheid or women's suffrage. It's a, it's a movement for civil rights and not identity. And I think that's really important. We are a community in protest, not a community in identity. Uh, and I think that that's why I, I, I think it's important to say that because we are individuals with our own politics. And I don't want to, you know, people say, well, you've got ex-Muslims on the far right and they're defending uh, the genocide in the Palestinian territories. Well, you know, the, the reality is that we all speak for ourselves, we are individuals, and we have our own politics as well. For me, I think refugees should be welcome. I'm against the sex, uh, uh, sexual uh, rape and harassment and, and murder of women by Hamas, uh, not just in, in Israel, but in Palestinian territories. I'm also against genocide, uh, you know, and so on and so forth. So I think identity politics is dangerous, and I think we need to move away from it. And to remember that we are all human first and foremost. Mm. Just pass on. Yes. I don't have an intervention. I actually had a question. Just, uh, I want to learn. Po I, po want, po post I want your to question learn. And, and we can yes. take it afterwards. Um, well, coming back to the question of um, those uh, well-meaning Westerners that you expressed a lot of deception. Um, I want to hear each of you so tell me, uh, again, keep in mind the well-meaning Westerners, one thing they got wrong about being anti-racist. About, about being an, uh, about anti-racism. Uh, yeah, just keep that thought and we move on to the gentleman sitting there and I also noticed two in back uh, and then we'll be the two later, uh, two la <laughs> at the last, please. To follow up on that, and. Um, uh, I'm Lawrence Krauss, a physicist, um, and sort of ask a question, but also provoke. Uh, the interesting thing that seems to me is that one is seeing attacks on, to, f to follow up on what Miriam said, identity politics being used to to label people and, and, and go against universalism in many of the countries you're talking about from the right, but living in, in, in North America, it's concerning to me that I, I'm seeing that much more from the left now and the left are using identity politics in a way that um, is particularly worrisome. And I, I wanted people to comment on whether they're, si it, from, from your perspective, whether you see that as worrisome as well. Thank you. And, and uh, the one sitting right behind you can just take it and, and please keep it brief and, and keep your thoughts. You'll get a chance to summarize at the end. Please. Uh, thank you so much. I have a, a comment and a question. I'll get to the question first. Um, I'm a radical feminist. And I've struggled with this whole identity politics thing. I'm also a Jew, so I'm no longer affiliated with any feminist organizations because they're on the left and the left is racist, uh, towards Jews anyways in Norway. Um, so I, my question is, how can feminists be better? Because I am a Western feminist, I live in Norway. Uh, be better on the whole criticizing of uh, Islam, Orthodox Christianity, Orthodox Judaism, all the orthodoxies uh, that repress women worldwide. Yes, and uh, I think I saw two uh, people uh, in, in the back row there. Uh, yeah, keep it brief, uh, 45 seconds, and then we'll go to a summarize from the panel. Hello, uh, how do you define identity politics? And if you think so, how is being an ex-Muslim part of that? Well, that's a, that's a short and big question. And uh, the last uh, intervention in behind. So, uh, I can, um, even though I'm Norwegian, I can recognize troubles about my own identity and what that means. I mean, I'm autistic, I'm gay. I used to grow up in a Christian sectarian community and what I noticed and I will I pose this as a disclaim as a question do you think it's not about who you are but what that means because I'm autistic I'm gay but what does it, that mean for me for example being Pakistani does that always need to mean religious or can Pakistani also means secularism because I, I, I think when it comes to identity we put the things 
we want into that identity self and we shouldn't imprison identity is what I'm saying. Just pass the microphone to the gentleman within 30 seconds because we're running out of time. I just heard the statement from one ab uh, about uh, left in Norway being racist against Jews. As long as I'm Norwegian and living here, and we are lots of, let's say, guests from other countries, it's totally wrong statement. Sorry, don't do that. Well, people can disagree, and uh, I, I have the unfortunate task to say that you have to be very brief in things that you could have uh, elaborated for a long time, but one minute each to give your final thoughts. We can start with you, Taha. Well, uh, I, I'm I, I, not to repeat myself again, but uh, just to say that again, I, I, I completely agree with what Mariam said uh, about uh, uh, you know identity politics being a negative thing because I think uh, you know identities is an individual idea and the states should not decide that and it should not and that's what we're saying. This is and this comes from the whole history of nation states and how they're built and how they protect their borders and how they create this this idea of identity. Uh, and and going back to what what Nadia was saying about you know uh, uh, laicity in in France where I live also, um, uh, it's happening a lot. You know. Uh, Nowadays, uh, ex-Muslims are being used uh, by not just by far-right movements, but also by the far-right media uh, to to sort of like you know uh, give this whole sort of idea that that there's something wrong with Islam, and we should be very careful uh, when we engage with the media. And I think that's uh, something that I. I continue to do because I get approached by far-right media a lot of times and you have to say no to them because otherwise they're using you for your own agenda. So we have to remember that for sure. Sorry. I too have got to um, uh, agree with um, what Maria ma uh, made as a distinction and I think sometimes language is too limited and terms get overused. So ideally we have the time to unpack these things and define them. Um, but I think most of us, when we were thinking of the the positive aspects of identity politics, it really, if you take it to its core, it's really what Mariam was talking about, and it's about parity in terms of rights, um, and I think it's a misnomer for us to tie that to identity. We, sh we should get away from identity, um, and maybe we need a new term. Um, but I think these movements, for example, like the ex-Muslim movement, is really about restoring uh, rights as opposed to focusing on the identity itself. Um, well, I cannot give an answer uh, in this uh, um, atmosphere like this, but uh, what I think, because what I hear, it's concerned me, uh, and these are true. Unfortunately, we're dealing, me, myself, in these uh, few years in Greece, I'm dealing with uh, with something that it's identified itself as a left, but me as a person that has come from one underground movement that we're fighting against so many things in Iran, I cannot find common ground with them. So I said, like, if you're left, I'm some, I'm, I don't know. I, I cannot put this name. So I said, like, okay, I can understand that I'm dealing generally with liberalism. I can understand this. So in this liberalism, we have to deal with racism. This is anti-Semitism as well, also. I mean, this is what I, we're dealing with it in Greece. So when all of these things happen, it, we, I mean, uh, as I said in the first, it's very complicated to talk about it that why did I escape from Iran? What was the reason? And so many other things. So it's not also only one state. It's, you know, the, the whole society, because we're dealing with the concept that they know us with those concepts. And when I came out, they don't call me refugee. I mean, let me also mention this. They don't call me refugee. I'm a migrant. So by this, they ignore all of my perspective and background. They don't want to deal with it. They don't want to see it. Why I was fighting against death penalty for children. What was the reason? So I was tortured in Iran because I was saying, you are talking against God order. And now I came to West and they expect me to be that Muslim for them. I was like, well, I'm sorry. <laughs> I burn this book. I, I fight against it. And also in church, if, if they do the same thing, I would go against it. And this was the thing that we mentioned it also in, with the feminist in Greece, that look, this femicide must address it with what church is doing it. 
And if you don't go against it, well, it's, you make it also complicated for many feminists from Middle East also to work with you. Because at the end, you don't challenge the core of the problem. Thank you. Rahila. I think the question of identity politics is really quite deep, and I'm not sure I can do it justice in 30 seconds. But I think that the main point I want to make about it is that it can have a radical starting point. The problem is the end point. It can be the trigger, but it should not be the goal because it ends up in a cul-de-sac. And so, for example, if you take South Old Black Sisters, or yeah, so we, we came, it's an identity of black women. It's a radical identity which said, it's situated in our experience of racism and misogyny and the intersection between those two. The issue is, how expansive are your identities? What, this is why I talked about the choice of choosing black over Indian or choosing black over um, Hindu or whatever. And given the politics of Britain, it, was, it works. I mean, it doesn't always work in every framework. So the issue really is making, uh, uh, doing politics on the basis of solidarity, but it does often begin as an identity, as feminists, as women. And then you choose to be a feminist because there are black women who don't, for example, challenge Islam or religion. And, but, so we, that's why I say it's important to, to come together on the basis of a political program, but it does start often in identity and it's often recognized by the state. So for example, we have, a kind of authenticity, where, which means we can raise money to provide services for domestic violence for women from those communities because we can say we've come from those communities, we know what those issues are. So it's not necessary, it's the way it's being used, both by the left and the right, which I think is a problem. Thank you. Uh, Gita, your final words? I, th I think we've all faced problems with the left because many of us have come from these backgrounds, a part of the left. So I don't, I'm not going to talk about that much because we've talked about it. I think the right is a huge problem that sometimes is not being seen. It is dangerous to, to any of us with brown and black faces. It's dangerous to white dissidents. We, when you have Project 2025 20, in America, which wants to strip women of all their rights and to create a theocratic state in a country which was founded with a secular constitution, I think we're in extreme danger. And we have judges that are pushing for that, you know, Supreme Court judges. So this is not a thing just on the streets of the Antifa movement. It's coming down from the Supreme Court and the overturning of Roe versus Wade and all the other decisions stemming from it. So the right is a problem. Um, Ina, the, 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 uh, there's so many examples, it's very hard to choose one. Sometimes, um, some of the things that, are, that feminists are accused of is not what feminists have done. So there are many Western feminists who've stood for universal rights. I don't want to, anybody to feel that there are not women who have not stood with us, for us, fought with us, and so on. That's happened. When I was one of the founders of Women Against Fundamentalism in 1989 during the Rushdie Affair, which I might talk about a little later. The, the, it was a coalition of women together on the basis of values. It was a time when there were a lot of movements that were splitting, there were black movements, there was uh, you know, different kinds of feminisms and so on, but it was women coming together saying, we're against religious fundamentalism, whether we're Irish Catholics or from that background, whether we come from a Hindu background, from a Muslim background, from whichever background. So we got together and we said we're standing against, we're standing for Rushdie's right to right. Um, uh, but FGM, the defense of FGM in universities is one example. Um, and the whole architecture of a kind of very, what I think of as right wing, it considers itself politi 20 seconds. Uh, progressive, but of right wing uh, post-colonial theory, which to me has nothing to do with the people who fought for freedom and what they fought for, what my ancestors fought for was a secular state and for freedom of women and for universalism. And post-colonial theory tells you this is all Western values and it's, uh, you know, secularism, universalism is a pile of shit. For me, the, the liberation movements were about all those things. And I think when you're talking about feminism, it's to have a feminism 
that can discuss anti-Semitism and Israeli genocide at the same time, as well as uh, the attacks of fundamentalists. So. Th thank you so much. Uh, going to leave the floor to you. Are going to present the poem? Uh, yeah. So before we end, we have a uh, we have a poem, and uh, this. Yeah, yeah, sure. And uh, this is what's standing between you and lunch. So uh, yeah, <laughs> no worries. Looking forward to that. it. Completely forgot about it. Okay. So um, when Mariam invited me to uh, speak here, she said, "Can you write a poem about the themes of this panel?" And I thought, God, I don't have time for that. But as it happened, the last time I was in Oslo uh, to speak at a conference here, in fact, uh, when I met Shabana at that uh, particular conference, I wrote a short poem for about my journey in from Oslo airport. So, from Oslo airport, dull gray, muddy white, slate gray, virginal white, nuclear gray, lily white, overworked slushy browns, a blizzard of whites and grays, winter in Oslo. Then, peeping through, I see the welcome relief of reds, blues, greens, of graffiti on gray concrete. Words in English I understand. Go home. On the way into Oslo, from the airport. Thank you. <laughs>